really quickly, a little personal introduction to Rick. I've known Rick since 2014. I met him at my very first travel conference in Athens, Greece. And uh, we always laugh because we both took a workshop together that only we were the only two students and it was a two day photography workshop with two teachers and we were the only two students so we became really close really quickly and I've been following this guy like been connecting with him we've met up in Thailand we've met up in New York we've met up in I don't know Greece we've met up in a bunch of other countries and I just like love learning from him because I feel like Rick is such a has such a wealth of knowledge and he really does know so much about the world and when you meet him you sort of think like okay this guy is cool and then you start talking to him and you're like oh my god please don't ever stop talking because you know so much and I want to know everything that you know all right that's my short little introduction <laughs> Rick, I'm going to let you take it away. I Oh, before I go, I do want to say Rick is hosting such a cool event this fall. It's called the Extraordinary Travel Fest. He's going to tell you about it at the end of his presentation. It's in Armenia. I don't know any events that are in Armenia. So this is going to be an incredible event full of extreme travelers and people that are just like looking to connect with each other about amazing travel destinations. So I'll let Rick talk, but take it away. Thanks okay, wow. Well, <laughs> good evening to everyone in the US. As Erica says, I'm in Bangkok, so a little bit earlier in the morning. And my advice to anybody, if you want the biggest press, the biggest positive information about you, spread out. Hire Erica Vivro Hackman as your PR agent. Um, th that's quite an introduction and that's going to be very hard for me to live up to. So just want to say greetings to everybody. I'm going to kind of jump right in. I'm going to give a quick shout out to Horace Tom. So he is going to be one of the individuals in essence that I'm talking about today. Horace has been to every country in the world. That is what I'm personally striving for. I've been to 151 countries, some pretty good progress, but there's still a lot more to go. So right now I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this will work as always. And as Erica said, my name is Rick Gazarian. I'm a travel content creator. I have a podcast, Counting Countries, and I have a blog, Global Gaz, and all of the social media that goes with it. As I just mentioned, I've been to 151 countries, and I'm trying to visit every single country in the world. So the first question you might be asking, how many countries are there in the world? That's not a straightforward answer. So I'm going to take you through a quick look at how many countries there are, but we still might not have the number that we all agree on after I share this information. The number I like to start off with, the benchmark for me, is the United Nations. The United Nations recognizes 193 sovereign nations. So for many people, that's a list that they're pursuing or they consider that is every country in the world. But on that list, there's two countries that are not included that you might consider countries. One is the Vatican and the other is Palestine. So they're not considered a sovereign nation within the 193. Those are called observer states. So that brings you to 195 countries. The next category are countries that are partially recognized by some UN members. Now, I'm going to guess that you recognize two of those names. They're very well known, Kosovo and Taiwan. And you can see there's not a plurality of countries that recognize them, but Kosovo, over 100 UN countries recognize them. Taiwan, only 14, and there's a lot of politics involved. Over the years, more countries have recognized Taiwan, but China, over time, is chipping away at the countries that recognize Taiwan and getting those nations, often by economic support, aid, to move their recognition from Taiwan to China. I might also point out number two, Sawari Arab Democratic Republic. You might not be that familiar with this one, but look at how many UN countries recognize them 
as an independent nation. If you pull out your globe, take a look at Morocco. Right below Morocco is something called Western Sahara. In this giant region between Morocco and Mauritania, it's, it's a little confusing. Who controls it? Who recognizes it? Who governs it? But two thirds of it is controlled by Morocco and the inner one third is controlled by the Sarari Arab Democrat Republic. It's only about 500,000 people, but most African nations and just recently the US recognize it as the, uh, as the true government of this piece of land. So uh, to keep a little current, I just updated these slides the other day and I had, to add, I had to add in two new quote unquote countries. And this is talking about the war in Ukraine. And if you might be paying attention, there are two new countries recognized as sovereign nations, but by only one country in the world. So in the far east of Ukraine, which is predominantly ethnic Russian and Russian speaking, which Russia invaded back in 2014, Russia has now taken the step just on February 21st to recognize these two countries as independent nations. Russia's done this before. If you look up above Abkhazia and South Ossetia, these are two regions within Georgia. In 2008, Russia invaded them. And these are now de facto nations recognized by Russia. And you can see by four other countries. And who are these four other countries? Allies of Russia. So here's eight more countries. So is it 203 countries, 193 plus two plus eight? Well, here's two more examples. This is also somewhat driven by the Soviet Union falling apart in 1991. Artsakh is a country that's not recognized by any other UN countries, but it's recognized by three other non-recognized countries. And same with Transnistria. These countries look like countries, meaning they have their own governments, their own armies. They have their own currencies and national flags and even national anthems. Yet by all of the UN, no UN member recognizes these two countries. So a lot of people are driving their list out of these countries, whether it's 193, whether it's 195, or they add in the eight uh, partially recognized countries. For some people, that's not enough. And they're looking at other lists. So you can take a peek at the Olympics, which is comprised of, quote unquote, 206 countries. And if you like soccer slash football, FIFA has 211 different nations competing when it comes to that sport. And the, you might see this ISO on a lot of products that you buy, the International, Stan, uh, International Organization of Standards. They recognize 249 countries. So they have a code that they have for each country. So I've given you a lot of different numbers to think about, a lot of different lists to think about. But again, for even some people who are really extreme travelers, they are looking for more comprehensive list. So three travel clubs have been started over the years. You have Traveler Century Club that was started in the 1950s by a group of people in LA. They divide the world into 330 places. So, so much more than 193 UN nations. Charles Veeley founded Most Travel People. Go check out his website. He divides the world into 995 places. No one has ever finished this list. It's that comprehensive and that challenging. Not to be outdone, Harry Midsidzis of Greek in the UK, of Greece in the UK. In 2008, started Nomad Mania. He divides the world into 1,301 places. Now, remember these three names, TCC, Most Travel People, Nomad Mania. I'm gonna talk about them in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. Check out their websites, they're great resources. But let's get a little bit more in the weeds and a little bit more in the debate of what is a country, what isn't a country, how many countries there are. 
So we all recognize these people, one of the most famous families in the world. But do you recognize this? Well, on the far left is me. But I am with a different royal family, not as famous as Prince Charles and Queen Elizabeth, but this is another royal family. That's Prince Liam, Prince James, and I was lucky enough to win an audience with them. Well, they are the royal family and the founders of the Principality of Sealand. They consider a sovereign nation that was founded in the late 1960s by their grandfather, who is just this unbelievable character. Now, what is, what is in a country? We can debate this all day, all night, even better over a couple of beers. But here is the Principality of Sealand. So on the left-hand side, you see Harwich and Clacton on the sea. That's England. Sealand is that tiny star in uh, the English Channel. Let's take a look at what Sealand looks like. There it is, a sovereign nation with its own flag, national anthem, currency, passports, royal family, and so many more trappings of a nation. This is a former military fortification that was used in World War II and then abandoned. Prince Paddy Roy Bates in the 1960s invaded this nation because there were actually other people living in it, kicked those people off, and has claimed this small platform as the Principality of Sealand since the late 1960s. I've, I've been very fortunate. I've been one of the few tourists who've been lucky enough to visit this nation and meet the royal family. So quite an experience in memory. And let's give one more crazy example of what people are doing. Have you heard of the Principality of Islandia? In short, 80 guys and girls got together. They each contributed $3,000 and they bought an island in Belize. So this is the world's first crown-funded private island. And again, it has all the trappings of a nation. It has a flag and a national anthem, a democratically elected government. And you too, for the price of $25, can become and receive your own ID of Principality of Islandia, like Nicolas Cage. Okay, just joking, Nick Cage did not buy an ID, but that could be your picture. Uh, for a quick $25. So it's, it's no easy straight answer. It's quite a debate how many countries in the world. Me personally, I'm a purist. I simply go with 193, but we'll be visiting a lot of other places from those other lists in addition. What counts as visiting the country? There's no governing body. In other words, everybody makes up their own rules. What is your rule for visiting a country? So just to think about it, some people say, I want to sleep overnight. Another person is, I just want to put my foot over the border, a transfer at the airport, a visa, a beer. What is your rule? If you can write it in, in the chat box if you want. But even these are somewhat difficult. Not every country issues a visa. If you've been to Europe, you know, Schengen, you'll enter the first country and then you'll never get another visa after that if you stay in Schengen. Um, maybe you're going to Liechtenstein, a small country of, I think, 40,000 people. Maybe spending the day there is enough. Maybe you don't want to sleep overnight. Uh, transfer at the airports. For me, that personally doesn't count. I've never been to Ireland, but I've been to the airport in Ireland. I personally don't count it. <clears throat> so this is one of the most fascinating places in the world to me. This is the border between North and South Korea. So here you see these three soldiers staring into North Korea. This is the joint security area, Pamajan village. And this is an area uh, maintained by the UN. And this is where they have conversations when they do sometimes between North and South Korea. Now on the left, you're looking at the map and you see that red line. That's the actual border between these two countries. So you can see the border goes through the series of buildings. You, me, 
can fly to Seoul. And for like $80, you can take a tour to Parmesan Village. I highly encourage you to do it. And you can stroll, well, with under the eyes of the security, under the soldiers, you can walk around this area. And you have the ability to walk into that blue building. And if you walk to the far end, you're technically in North Korea. But does that count for you? Well, there's been some famous people who have been up to this border. So looking in the top right hand corner, that photo, you see former President Trump reaching and extending his arm to Kim Jong-un. That raised cement line is the actual border between the two countries. Now, after that photo, both of them walk back and forth between North and South Korea. So I just asked you a moment ago, what counts as visiting a country? I showed you the map. That line goes through those buildings. Would that count for you? Would that count as visiting North Korea? If you took the tour to uh, Seoul, drove up here an hour further, and then crossed that building? Some people count it. So as one example, Lexi Alford, who I'm going to be talking to in a moment, couldn't get into North Korea because U.S. citizens are banned by the U.S. government to travel to North Korea. It's the only country the U.S. government does not allow U.S. citizens to get into. So Lexi was trying to travel to every country in the world, was trying to get a visa to go to North Korea, was not successful. Her only pathway was to take that tour and walk into that blue building and hold up that sign as being her 196th country. Why count countries? A lot of people, not a lot, some people when I go, oh, I'm traveling to every country in the world, they might be a bit dismissive. They're like, oh, well, you know, I'm not into numbers. You know, I like to take my time. I want to, you know, I'm into slow travel. I like to spend a week or a month in each country. I'm going to share with you what I think it's a great idea. So some people think it's for bragging rights. And I think at some level that might be true. You see that number there, 0. 0.00000003. That's the percentage of people that have traveled to every country in the world. So we're talking a very few people who have been on this earth that have traveled to every country in the world. So there are some bragging rights involved. So let's talk about some of the reasons. Now, you, I'm guessing everybody recognizes these places. I mean, you know about these places as a kid. They are so iconic. And the I don't care how much you've traveled, in my opinion, if you get up to the top and you look over uh, Machu Picchu, if you are at Taj Mahal at sunrise or walk across the Great Wall, these are such important and stunning and historic places around our globe. Now, we all know about them. They're all amazing. Many of us have been, many of us are striving, but maybe there's other wonders of the world that we're missing that are not as publicized, that people don't write about or take Instagram photos at the same amount we take photos of Petra or Machu Picchu. What I'm getting at, if you are traveling to every country in the world, if you are counting countries, this acts as a catalyst, a mechanism to push you outside of your boundaries, to consider visiting places that you've never considered before. And maybe you will see the equivalent of a Machu Picchu, of a Chichen Itza that you had, did not know anything about but exist in all these other countries. So I'm gonna give you some examples. In Armenia, which uh, Erica had mentioned, I'm hosting the Extraordinary Travel Festival in October. These stone crosses can only be found in Armenia. They're called Kachkars. They date back to medieval times, hundreds and hundreds of years. These intricate carvings of stones are found on Lake Sevan in Armenia. It's the largest grouping there's nearly a thousand of these medieval uh, stone carved crosses. It's fantastically beautiful. And it was a highlight of my visit, uh, uh, one of my most recent visits to Armenia. Again, they're not publicized like Taj Mahal, obviously, 
but this is something you should consider putting on your bucket list. Um, I recently, uh, well, 2019, had the great opportunity to visit Afghanistan. I'd seen this picture of this shrine in Marzi Sharif for years. And these colors resonated with me. This design and tile work it meant something to me. And this had been on my bucket list for years. I got the uh, opportunity to visit this unbelievably peaceful and beautiful shrine up in Northern Afghanistan. One of my favorite countries in the world is Burma or Myanmar. Many of you might have heard of the temples of Bagan. Google that if you haven't. And to me, I've been lucky. I've been there four different times over the last 20 years. It's 2,000 pagodas dotted right over the horizon on a river. It's one of the most stunning things I've ever seen. But there's even a more off the beaten path equivalent of the temples of Bagan in Burma. It's called Marak U. It gets one ten thousandths of the visitors. But here is another incredible series of temples in Marak U that just blew me away. Algeria, a country in Northern Africa, great infrastructure, inexpensive to travel and so much to see. One of the things that also just stunned me, I really had no expectation or didn't know what I was going to see, Gardea. It's in southern part of Algeria. It's in the middle of the Sahara. And this ancient civilization that had been living here for a couple thousands of years in the middle of the desert, who are living in a very, very conservative manner in these walled villages. So it's like going back in time. And you can imagine going back to the Sahara a couple thousand years ago and seeing how people were still living back then. Some of you, uh, I think this is a country on many people's bucket list, Bhutan. It's 500,000 people between the two biggest countries in the world, China and India, and they've preserved their way of life. And same thing here in the middle of the country is, in Chuangzi, small town, is a Zong. A Zong is a combination for monastery and administrative center. This is around 400 years old. And to wake up in the morning and to see this beautiful, beautiful structure set in the mountains in the mist, this is another reason you want to extend your boundaries and pursue countries, maybe every country in the world. Another great thing, the Grand Mosque of Jene in Mali, this is the largest mud structure in the world. It's a UNESCO World Heritage. And same thing here, I uh, walked up this nearby apartment building at sunrise, had this amazing view of the mosque as the sun set down, the evening call to prayer, men came out to pray, and I was the only foreigner in this town. And it was, again, just an amazing experience. Same thing here, Sana, Yemen. Uh, I'm definitely not encouraging you to visit at this time. But you know, even before the awful civil war, this was not a popular place to visit. This is the capital. And I mean, to say stunning and is a, is a underestimate estimation of, of that. This is considered the first skyscrapers in the world. Again, these are mud structures. So the architecture is beautiful and unique. And to walk around the streets of this town was a special experience. I just went to Cameroon. It was my 151st country. It's in Central Africa. And again, I, you know, I got to be honest, I don't know that much about Cameroon. I know a lot more now that I spent two weeks there. But I think this opens doors. This opens up the experiences. So I had to fly to the northern part of the country and then drive eight hours to meet this man. As you can see, he's holding a crab. And people come to him. He's sort of the local witch doctor, the local medicine man, but he will also tell your fortune. You know, he's reading tarot cards, except for him. There's no tarot cards. He tells your fortune with this crab. So I got a one-on-one -on -one consultation with this man in his crab in a very remote region of Cameroon. So something I'll probably remember for the rest of my life. Two more examples uh, in central 
northern eastern Africa is Chad. Again, they don't get many visitors. But I spent a week there in November. I had one of my best travel experiences. I went for a festival. It's called Jarawal. This is a tribe of nomadic cow herdsmen, the Wodabi people. They walk around in Niger, Chad, northern Cameroon. But at the end of the rainy season, they all gather together in the savannah, just in the middle of nowhere. It took a day and a half driving to get where they were. And for over a week, they celebrate the end of the rainy season and they have this amazing matchmaking festival or ceremony where the women get to choose the men. And as you can see, the men have to dress up. They have to put on makeup. They sing and dance literally from the late afternoon into the evening, I would go to bed in my tent. I would wake up at 6 a.m. the next day. They're still singing and dancing and it's going on. So an amazing, amazing, unique experience. Last up, another country I just went to, South Sudan. It's the newest country in the world. Just became independent in 2011. And here are people from the Mundari tribe, another nomadic group who also herd cows. And I spent three days camping next to them. And you'll have to check out my photos on Instagram, but just the same thing. They're living the same way as they did 100 or 500 years. They live with their cows. Um, they are one with their cows. So just watching and being with them over that couple of days and watching them interact with nature and the livestock, just a, a unique experience. So in summary, I gave you, I think, a lot of great reasons or examples to, to expand your horizons. Consider going to these other countries because they will offer you so much that you're probably not that aware of. So I was talking about that 0.000003%. So that is 264 people have been to every country in the world, known people, divided by 7.7 .7 billion. That's how I got to that number. Now, crazily, to me, I was shocked when I found this out. More people have been to outer space than have been to every country in the world. In fact, I just downloaded an app recently. You can see that number six, that's the app. Of, and it tells you how many people are in space on any given day. So that, as I think you know, if you're reading the papers, you know, between Elon Musk and uh, Bezos, I mean, more and more people will be going to outer space, possibly at a faster rate, but that's up for debate. Just to give you a historical perspective, going to every country in the world has become a thing. So if you, again, these are the known numbers and facts that we're aware of. So back in 1988, we, rec we recorded the first person who traveled to every country in the world. And for a couple of decades, not a lot of people were trying to accomplish the goal. But as social media proliferated, is more people found each other. So I don't care what your passion is. Whatever your passion is, you can find your tribe online, right? It doesn't matter if it's pottery or walking or whatever crazy hobby you might have, you're able to find your tribe. So people started finding each other as Facebook and Instagram got more popular. It became a community which you could depend on each other, get ideas, get inspiration. So you can see in 2019, it grew to 39 people. 39 people traveled to every country in the world. Of course, COVID hit and you could see the number went down drastically. The full year of COVID in 2021, only seven people were able to accomplish the goal. I mean, that's an 80 plus reduction compared to 2019. So who has traveled to every country in the world? And I wanna give you some other stories of inspirational people that I've either met or spoken to who have just done incredible things. Look at Babis Bezos in the top left. He's a Greek man, unbelievably well-traveled. He's been to every country in the world twice. I'm friends with him on Facebook. Every week, he is traveling somewhere new to remote, remote challenging places. The guy has endless energy. Jessica Nabongo in the top right is the American Ugandian 
We believe she's the first black woman to travel to every country in the world. She did that the other year. Bottom left, I just met this guy. Um, I was in Phuket last week. I'd been introduced to Anderson Diaz in the bottom left two months ago through a mutual friend on WhatsApp. I randomly reached out to him and we started talking and we both realized we were in Phuket. The next night he came over with six of his Brazilian friends for dinner and drinks. But Anderson grew up in a favela, one of the poor regions of Brazil. He traveled to every country in the world. He now has 1.4 million followers on Instagram. He's a real inspirational guy. He just shared with me, he submitted his uh, paperwork to the Guinness World Records to claim the record of man uh, or person fastest to travel to every country in the world. Melissa Roy, bottom right with her mother, has traveled to every country in the world. She is the first woman of South Asian heritage to have uh, been able to complete that. So let's look at a couple more guys. This guy is a pretty awesome dude. If you, I, I hope one day to sit down and have a beer, beer with them. So it's challenging enough to visit every country in the world. But this guy, Graham Hughes, a Brit, decided to do it without ever taking an airplane. It took him over three years. He spent six nights in jail in the Republic of Congo. The government accused him of taking photos of police officers. He was in the newspapers. The embassy was trying to get him released. He then took a open boat from Senegal, eight days in the ocean, to get to Cape Verde, an island. And here again, this one was a little bit his fault. He didn't have a visa. He spent a week in Cape Verde in jail for entering that country. So this guy went through so much and accomplished so much to get the Guinness World Record of traveling to every country in the world only by land and sea. But there's always someone in the wings who's trying to do something also very amazing. Thor Peterson, a Dane. Now he said, I'm gonna do the same thing as Graham, but make it even more difficult, even more pure. Meaning Thor said, I'm gonna spend a minimum of 24 hours in each country. Graham didn't, meaning a couple of times Graham stepped over the border, looked at his GPS and said, oh, I'm in Zimbabwe, I'm done. Thor said, I'm gonna spend a minimum of 24 hours in each country. That makes it so much harder just with that fact. He'll never go to Denmark until he finishes and he'll never fly. Well, he left home in October of 2013. He thought he would be done in three years. He still has not been home. He just got to his 197th country, Australia. He got stuck in Hong Kong for two years. This has turned into one of the biggest challenges of his life, to say the least, to be able to accomplish this. So he still has seven more countries to visit. He's hoping to do it in a year and a half. But this guy is hardcore. He's a purist. Check him out on social media and support Thor. Another amazing guy, Nick Butter. He's an extreme athlete. He's a Brit. And I spoke to him and he shared the story of running a marathon in every country in the world. On average, during his journey, every four days, he was running a new marathon in a different country. Think about that. You're dealing with jet lag and canceled flights and new food and different temperatures. How difficult and challenging can tra uh, travel be? Imagine if you're running a uh, marathon every day. He literally, I forget what Pacific Island it was, let's call it Tonga, he suffered a heart attack on one of his runs. And he completed the run and then went to the hospital. So again, if you want to use the hard word hardcore, Nick Butter. Do you know her, Josh Stone? She is a Grammy Award singer from the UK. And she is so down to earth, so impressive, and I got to be honest, I wrote she performed in every country. That's not true. But she did a musical performance in every single country in the world, except for one, Iran. She arrived in Iran. It was her last country. She was ready to sing. She was arrested and deported. 
So really should say every country in the world except one. I hope she gets to go to Iran at some point and say, unbelievably impressive person. I bet we all know this guy. He is pretty popular, Drew Binsky. He's an impressive guy. I mean, unbelievably successful content creator. He's got nearly 10 million followers on YouTube and Facebook and over 5 billion views. Drew recently just finished up in November in Saudi Arabia. I was there at the same time. Uh, we uh, didn't get to see each other, but we were WhatsApping during his journey and a uh, pretty successful 10 year journey for him to visit every country. This guy is awesome. Francis from the US. He traveled, he, oh, let me take a step back. He bought a car, drove it into Morocco and then spent the next five years in Africa. He never left and he visited every single country, all 54 countries in Africa. Amazing stories, amazing experiences. I write he traveled with 3000 friends because that's what he estimates of the number of hitchhikers he picked up during his journey. He wanted to have the experiences, he wanted to meet locals, but he had a strategy. He would never pick up a single hitchhiker. He would pick up two, three, four, or five hitchhikers, being that people are generally good. So in other words, if you have five people in your car, five strangers, odds are, well, maybe there's one bad apple, but you're gonna have four good apples. So his strategy was the more the merrier, and he met a ton of great people. The other amazing thing he did, some of you might've heard of Seven Summits, climbing the highest mountain on each continent. Well, Francis was doing the 54 summits, climbing the highest peak in Africa in every country. Some are just hills, like in Gambia, of like 200 feet, but others were incredibly, incredibly difficult. He still has a couple of left, but just an amazing, interesting guy. Another guy who's almost like an explorer, like he is like Shackleton. He's been to every country in the world, and he has completed the seven summits. And a trip for him, he told me this story of going to Venezuela. And in Venezuela, there's still some untouched remote regions. And he told me this one story of his adventure where he literally hired two boats, some uh, indigenous people. And for two months, he went down this river to explore this uncharted corner of Venezuela. Okay, if you want some inspiration, Audrey. Walsworth from the US. We believe she's the first woman to travel to every country in the world. And that she started traveling back in the 1960s and unbelievably impressive just for that fact, but she's 87 years old and still traveling. I mentioned to you one of the travel clubs, Traveler Century Club, that's 330 places. She's one of the few people that have uh, finished off the TCC list. There's less than 10 people who have done that. And one of the ways she accomplished that is off of Yemen is an island called Socotra. It's part of Yemen, it's very remote. They call it the Galapagos of the Arabian Sea. That is one of the places on the Traveler Century Club list. She just went there in 2020. So as an 85 year old, she is flying to Yemen. And it was her second attempt, meaning the first time she flew to Egypt to pick up her connection, she missed the connection, so I had to go back another time. So really impressive woman. She'll be coming to the uh, Extraordinary Travel Festival. I mentioned Lexi before. She holds the Guinness World Record for traveling to every country in the world. And she, is, she was 21 when she finished. And I interviewed her a couple of times. I mean, she's, I think, in some ways, a lot more mature than me. And, you know, she overcame quite a lot as a young woman visiting every single country uh, before she turned 22. So a lot of kudos to Lexi. Now, I've met so many great people and I've been so lucky to, to meet all these great travelers around the world or through social media, but there's always a couple of bad eggs. I interviewed William Backland several years ago. He was like 23. And he was the great grandson of a billionaire. 
So I would get emails from William. He's like, and I'm trying to do my, he's British. And um, I'll do my British accent via email. He's like, dear Richard, I just returned from South Sudan where I chartered a plane with 30 security guards. So he would email me every now and then with these amazing stories. He was able to take his you know, immense resources and wealth and do these amazing stories, uh, amazing adventures that most people can't do. And this was when he was 23. So I always imagine when he's 40 or 50 or 60, he would have gone to every corner in the globe. But several years after I interviewed him, we found out his name is not William Bacolet. His real name is Jesse Simon Gordon. He wasn't the great grandson of a billionaire, but he lived in a lower middle class family in Birmingham. And he had grifted people, other travelers of 800,000 euros over a couple year time period. So in other words, he was a con man. Um, in fact, if you guys have a subscription to HBO, they even did a one hour documentary on his fake persona and how he conned about 20 different travelers out of 800,000 euro. So a lot of great people, but pay attention. So as I just said, I've, I've spoken to all these people on my podcast, Counting Countries, you can check it out. Um, and this is not for the faint hearted. It's tough. So again, the, you know, at one point, Americans could not get into Syria, but there's one corner, can, can, uh, one corner of Syria controlled by the Kurds, and you could exit Iraq and enter this area of Syria. Sam Goodwin did that, except he took literally a wrong turn down the street and ended up at a Syrian government military checkpoint, not an independent Kurdish checkpoint. He spent three months in a Syrian jail until he's released. So use your head, but it can be challenging. So how do you do this? I think I've, I've pointed to this. It's the community. So networking, networking, networking. And I'll even say Erica. You know, Erica and I met 2014. I really respect Erica in some ways, even though she's younger than me. Like, I don't know if mentor is the right word, but she's like the sounding board that I can approach and get feedback because I really appreciate what she tells me. So it's the same thing. I don't care if you're a teacher. I don't care if you're selling pension plans. I don't care what you're doing, but it's all networking. It's who you know and what information you can get. And you can find these communities and get information, actionable information that will keep you safe and help you accomplish school. I mentioned my podcast, go to Facebook. Every passport in the stamp is 13,000 people who are all focused on every country in the world. Check that out. Another group, West Africa is one of the more challenging corners of the globe. There's a special Facebook group to share information there. How does the airline know what the rules are for the country you're going to? In other words, do you need a visa? Is it visa on arrival? Do you need to have it in your passport before? What's the rules with COVID? Well, there's a giant database called Tematic. You can punch in where you're leaving and where you're going and you'll see the same rules the airline sees. So take a look at Tomatic. You can find a free version on United Airlines uh, website. And that's one of the things I do due diligence. I mentioned the three clubs, become members, create profiles. TripAdvisor form is another great area to post questions. And there's a great book which kind of uh, re-inspired me called Chasing 193, which interviews uh, 20 different travelers. Um, who have traveled to every country in the world. Okay, I spoke about these three clubs, 330, 995, 1301. I think I'm running short on time, so I'm going a little quicker. Um, yeah, so as I'm saying, you know, there's 193 countries in the world, but some people, that's not enough. It doesn't give a fair representation. So in this example here, I use the um, US. So a lot of people, Wait, if you look at the typical travel map, the TripAdvisor travel map, if you spend one day in New York or Hawaii or Kansas, you color in the whole map of the United States. What TCC is saying, okay, you need one visit to the contiguous US, but you also need to visit all of these other places. So they consider them 
a bit distinct or unique or different. So it's not just one quick visit to the US. You have to visit the contiguous US and then all those other places. TCC, you do have to pay to become a member. They have local chapters and meetings, virtual meetings. They have 1,400 members. They're the oldest club started in the 1950s. Charles Veeley is the founder of Most Traveled People. I could have done an entire presentation on this guy. He is insane and impressive and crazy. Um, so same thing here. Um, it's 52 different places in the contiguous U.S., 14 in northern, um, in the Arctic, a uh, bunch. So you, again, it's not enough just to visit Washington, D.C. It's not enough to visit L.A. He also maintains great list of World Heritage sites, beach, golf courses, restaurants. You can create your own profile, fill in your map, check your progress, and it's also fun it might be competitive, it might not be competitive, but he ranks and lists everybody so you can check out what everybody's doing. Nomad Mania is really a fantastic website. Take a look at it. It's a rabbit hole of information. They uh, divide the world into 1,301 places. And again, it's not enough to visit Arizona. You have to visit all those different places. Even really impressive, they maintain a list of 71 different places. So in other words, if you check on any one of the 1,301 regions, you click on that region and he's going to give you a suggested list of all the places you can visit. And the list are hyper-focused. He has a list of lighthouses, aviation museums, waterfalls, and 67 other different lists. So for me, for a fun one, I like to keep track of the different airports I've been to. I've been to almost 300 different airports and I've got them all within Nomad Mania. Same thing, create a profile, track your map and see what your peers are doing. So I mentioned I've been to 151 countries. This is my map at Nomad Mania. Now 151, it sounds impressive and this looks pretty impressive. I'm getting down to the end. But to give you an example of how little I've traveled, I'm now going to break it down by region, 1,301 regions. So remember what this looks like. I'm the man. I've been everywhere. I really haven't. So this is a lifelong pursuit. There's so much to see. And these travel clubs, Chasing 193 gives you the opportunity to see and do much more. Uh, okay, I'm at the end. Excellent. So, uh, well, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Nomadic Network. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, as I said, I have a podcast, Counting Countries. I have a blog, Global Gas. You can check out either one of those, subscribe. And of course, you can check out my social media. Uh, Erica mentioned the Extraordinary Travel Festival. It's October 14th in Armenia. You can purchase a ticket. I have a discount code ETF to save $50. So if you want to learn, if you want to meet the most accomplished and avid travelers, come to Yerevan to hear uh, conversations and panels, and of course, parties and dinners and explore uh, an amazing country. So thank you all. I think we have time for some questions if there are any. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, just like raise your hand, drop a one in the chat if you learned something today. If you learned something today, I feel like my mind is blown. I've watched Rick give, I think, four other TNN presentations. I've seen him give live presentations on places like Nargana Karbakh in like a bar in Bangkok. Like I've seen him and I feel like every time he shares, I'm just like, trying to soak in all the knowledge because honestly, how do you like, I'm a traveler and I don't know half of that stuff. So I'm just so grateful for people like you for being in our community and for sharing with us multiple times. Thank you so much. Saw a lot of hands raised there. Um, we have like just a few minutes for questions. So I actually just want to pick some of the questions and I'd love to invite everyone else to connect with Rick. 
um, and ask him your questions via Twitter, Instagram, DM, whatever you want. He is very easy to find and, and he'll always respond to you. So um, I've dropped his information in the chat a few times. So feel free to do that. Um, but Rick, um, can you just tell us how you have gone to 151 countries and what you do for a living? We got that question a few times and people are curious. <laughs> Yeah, of course. I mean, that, that's natural. So I always say I have two different jobs. Um, one is a travel content creator where I end up spending a fair amount of time and make very little money. So what pays my bills is they started a business back in 2011 in Chicago, and that's real estate investing. So I worked in financial services for many years. I got laid off in 08 during the financial crisis. And then I figured something out to give me flexibility and mobility. So real estate investing is the answer. Amazing. Um, I mean, that sounds like the dream. And also, I don't know if you guys picked this up, but Rick is an incredible photographer. Incredible. So if you ever get to see any of his work, I know it's all over his uh, Instagram and also his website, like just look through his shots. They're amazing. Um, Tammy is wondering, when will your podcast pick back up? Yeah. Hey, Tammy, uh, the podcast comes out once every two months and the next one hopefully should be out next week. I'm interviewing a gentleman Thursday of this week. So as quickly as I can produce it. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Lisa is wondering, have you been to every state and U S territory? No, I am missing, I, I can't remember, it's either five or six, um, but in my mind, there's no rush or pressure to do that. I'm more focused on some of the more challenging or harder uh, countries in the world, and at some point, I will finish up the U.S. Um, and hopefully spend a lot more time visiting parks, etc. That's awesome. And then Lisa also wanted to know, which I'm very curious about. So when you talk about this guy, Thor, that's trying to go to every country in the world without going back to his home country, how would he get visas when some of the visas require you to get them from your home country? Like, how do people figure that out? Yeah. So awesome question, Lisa. And you are quite aware that some countries require you to get or be in your home country to deal with the local embassy to get a visa. Um, I would say if there's a will, there's a way, but I'll give you an example. Equatorial Guinea in Africa, except for Americans and Chinese, is one of the most difficult visas to get in the world. Thor spent 90 days in the adjacent countries, networking, networking, calling, emailing until he's finally able to secure a visa that he was only supposed to get like back in his home country. So. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, there, where there's a will, there is a way, I guess. Um, I wanted to end with just, I know the extra, uh, so for everything that Rick does, I feel like it's all focused on this one goal of basically bringing together all these people that are just extreme travelers, right? So his podcast, his website, his every passport stamp. You guys, if you're not in this Facebook group, it is the Facebook group to be in to just like explode your wanderlust because honestly, they talk about the craziest things and like, everyone's commenting on every single post from their experience. And it blows my mind when it pops into my feed, but this extraordinary travel fest is going to be, I feel like unprecedented. And I wanted to ask you, what are you most excited about for this? I know you and Stefan, Stefan has also come on to CNN multiple times and spoken about you know, traveling to every country in the world about travel hacking for millions of points a year. Like you guys are running this awesome event. Like, tell me a little bit more about it. And also, can you drop in the chat if you've been to Armenia already and what you loved about it, or if you're curious about it? 
Yeah, well, I'm ethnically Armenian. I grew up in the U.S., but my great grandparents are Armenian. So, yeah, I've been to Armenia. In fact, I've been there every year uh, since 2003, except for COVID year 2020. So I'm biased, but I think it is legitimately a great place to visit. It's a compact, small nation that's diverse. It's got great infrastructure, easy to get around. It's inexpensive. There's historic monasteries and churches, beautiful nature, um, great food. The capital is this small, very walkable city, um, very cosmopolitan, great cafes, great restaurants, great music. It's one of my favorite places in the world. And uh, I'm actually going back next week for a month to plan more for the festival.